Hey guys, welcome back to the show, and on this episode, I'm going to be talking about a movie that has been requested quite a few times. Now, don't get me wrong, this movie definitely has its flaws, but there were also some elements of the story that I thought were actually pretty interesting. It's The Touch of Satan, and I have to say, this is a kick-ass poster. This looks really cool. The first thing you'll notice about this movie is that this print was not taken care of very well. This is so scratched up it's crazy. At some points it looks like someone must have thrown it on the ground and tap danced all over it, but it actually kind of adds to the aesthetic. In many ways this looks and feels like an old Grindhouse B movie, but in the end I found it to be surprisingly effective in some ways and I was actually impressed by some of the direction. Again, not perfect by any means. There's stuff that makes no sense at all. Some things aren't really explained, but this is one of those movies that I feel had an interesting idea that would be perfect for a remake if you address the parts that were lacking. And I'll talk about some of that stuff in more detail later in the video. The movie starts with this poor farmer being stabbed to death with a pitchfork. So it looks like we're in for a classic rural whodunit. Then we have the Strickland family gathered around the table chatting, when suddenly Lucinda comes bursting in through the door. Literally. And the whole family is like, God damn it, Lucinda, what did you do this time? You're all covered in blood. So it sounds like this has happened before, and that doesn't surprise me at all. I mean, old people are sneaky like that. That's why they get put in retirement homes, so that they can't sneak out and get into trouble form gangs. Because let's face it, if all the old people got together and formed a gang, we would be totally screwed. They got nothing to lose, and they know it. Anyways, now we have Jody, a young man who's driving across America because why the hell not? What else is there to do? So Jody makes a stop to fill up his car, and the gas station attendant tells him there's more to this town than meets the eye. Like what? Like murder, brother. Like murder. This job was done by one of them fromachidal maniacs. And we ain't got none of them around here. See, that's the thing. How do you know there isn't any in town? They could be hiding in plain sight. That's what makes them so good at being from a kidal. Anyways, Jody sees a nice winding road. So he's like, I should drive on that. Could be fun. And then he stops at a pond to have lunch. And you better be careful, Jody. I don't know the exact number of how many pond side picnics end in murder, but it's got to be high. That's why I don't do it anymore. I mean, think about it. How many people do you see doing that these days? Not a lot. It's because most of them are dead. This is where Jody meets Melissa, and she tells him that it's her family's pond. I bet you have nine boyfriends. No. None. You're putting me on. How come? It's just that we live on a farm. We grow walnuts, mostly. Yeah, she lives on a walnut farm, Jody. She doesn't have time for dating. Do you know how much attention walnuts need when you're raising them? You gotta get up bright and early so that you can milk them and feed them and uh, spank them? I don't know. I'm sure there's a lot of walnut chores that need to be done. Back-breaking walnut chores. So then she asks him to come up to the ranch and meet the family. Oh, will you give me a walnut? Yes. Maybe two. Oh my god, you would have to be insane to turn down an offer like that. It almost sounds too good to be true. A pretty girl who doesn't have a boyfriend who wants you to come up to her family's walnut ranch? <laughs> like, you lock that down and you are set for life. Meeting the parents in this situation would be pretty intimidating though, I have to say. I mean, this is walnut money we're talking about here. These people are not going to be easy to impress. Melissa's mom tells him he could use something other than a chili dog for a change, and he's in luck, because tonight it's roasted walnuts along with walnut stew. And I just made that last part up. I have no idea what they're having for dinner. Melissa, go get your father and tell him we've got help now. She's a pretty girl, isn't she? Yeah. I mean, no. Well, I mean, yeah, she's all right. It's just, uh, uh, that's not why I'm here. You know, it's it's not like I'm just looking for sex. <laughs> or your walnuts. You know, it's not like I, it's not like I came up with a plan months ago to drive all the way out here, 
gain your trust, and then raid your walnut reserves, take them back home, sell them, and live like a king. <laughs> that would just be crazy. I'm just passing through. So, so th this is organic? So Melissa goes and tells her dad, like, hey, we have a guest for dinner. And he's like, what the hell are you talking about? Who is this guest? And she's like, I don't know, some guy, I guess. I met him down at the pond. Melissa, you don't have the right. Exactly. You can't just invite people over for dinner on a whim. It's another mouth to feed. They might not have enough walnuts for that. <laughs> okay, I promise that's the last time I'm going to say walnut in this episode. Um... Actually, uh, yeah. So after dinner, Melissa invites him to stay over, and her parents are not thrilled with the idea at all. And Jody is like, yeah, okay. I mean, dude, you could cut the tension in that room with a knife. If it was me, I'd be out of there so fast, I'd leave a cloud of dust behind me. There's just no way I'd be able to sleep in that house feeling that awkward. I mean, something is obviously wrong here, and you're going to spend the night... So Melissa takes him outside for a walk and shows him around. This is where the fish lives. See, now hearing that would make me feel a lot better about everything. Because it makes sense. That's how you know she's sane. If she said something like, you know, the fish lives in the barn, then I'd be coming up with excuses as to why I suddenly can't spend the night. Okay, maybe one night. Jody explains that his father is a lawyer and that he wants Jody to follow in his footsteps and become a lawyer as well. But Jody told him he didn't know yet and that he needed to drive around the country to find what he wanted out of life. So he gave me the car, 300 bucks and a handshake and here I am. So when I first heard him say that, I thought it was ridiculous. I mean, $300 is not that much money. But when you adjust for inflation, it turns out to be more like $2,200 in today's money. That makes a lot more sense. I mean, I'm sure we've all been there. You know, we told our parents we didn't know what to do with our lives. They gave us a car, $2,200, and told us to just drive. Seriously, if I told my parents that, I could pretty much guarantee they would laugh at that harder than any joke I've ever told them in my life. So Melissa wants him to stay a few days because she's lonely. And Jody is like, yeah, okay, I mean, it's not like I have anything else to do. Melissa shows him to his bedroom, and this is where Jody learns a terrifying secret. They've got an old person living in this house, so Jody marches over to Melissa's room to find out just what the hell is going on here. He was under the impression that this house was geriatric free. So Melissa explains that Lucinda is her grandmother and that she looks like that because she was horribly burned when she was younger. But not to worry, she just went into his room because she was curious. And Jody is like, why didn't you tell me this before? Is there anybody else in this house that I don't know about? Lucinda. Oh, Lucinda. Oh, it's Lucinda, everybody. You know, it would have been nice to know that before she showed up in my room and scared the crap out of me. And I'm serious, I gotta wash these pants now. And these are my favorite pants. Love these pants. I'm sorry she frightened you, Jody. It's fine, I just, I don't feel safe sleeping in that room tonight. I think the best thing is for me to sleep in here. In your bed. You can sleep in the hall. You can use my pants as a pillow if you want. And I gotta side with Jody on this one. It would have been nice to know. Because what if you wake up in the middle of the night, you go to use the bathroom, and you run into her in the hallway, and you freak out because you think she's a goblin, so you push her down the stairs. It's gonna be really hard to get to sleep after that. The next day, they go out to the store, but the people in town aren't very nice to Melissa because they think she's a witch. Why do they think you're a witch? Because I am. Now, I want you all to take note, because that is how you deliver bad news. You just act like it's not that big a deal. And that way, it takes longer to sink in for the other person. For example, a few years ago, my girlfriend, at the time, was wondering why I didn't get her a birthday gift. And I was just like, well, I don't have any money right now because I spent my entire life savings buying vintage Bazooka Joe comics on eBay. 
I swear, it took her almost two hours before she decided to pack up her stuff. And in the end, she really missed out because I still have those comics and they don't even make those anymore. So <laughs> like they're bound to be worth something some day. But there's a problem. Turns out the sheriff's deputy is poking around the property, trying to solve the murder of the farmer from the beginning and he even finds the murder weapon. So he's about to call it in when Lucinda sneaks up on him and kills him with a hook. So you remember what I said about old people being sneaky? <laughs> there you go. And I, for one, am shocked. I mean, the fact that Lucinda even has that strength at that age is really impressive. See, that's what they call old person strength, you know? It comes from life experience and just being fed up with everything. Melissa and Jody come home and Melissa calms down Lucinda and takes her inside while Jody is starting to realize that this road trip of his is becoming more bizarre than he ever could have imagined. I mean, that postcard home has gotta be just filled front to back. Dear mom and dad, well, I can't say that it hasn't been interesting. And see, this is why you never stop for lunch. One minute you're enjoying a sandwich by a pond and life is good. The next, you're witnessing a human raisin murder a cop. Happens like that. So they handcuff Jody and lock him in a shed while the family gets rid of the evidence. And this rotating shot is actually my favorite shot in the entire movie. I think this is great direction, and this is why. This whole story is really about Melissa. The chaos going on around her is the result of a choice that she made a long time ago. And the thing is, at this point in the movie, that hasn't been revealed yet, but this shot makes it clear that she is at the core of everything. I want you to follow me in the pickup truck. And for Pete's sake, drive carefully. We don't want to be stopped. You can hear all the commotion going on in regards to her family trying to quickly cover up this murder, but it's been relegated to the background because it all revolves around Melissa. Then they gather around the table for what can only be described as the most awkward dinner of all time. And I can only imagine how I would feel if I was in Jody's shoes. I'd be like, you people all make me sick. And to think I was gonna continue to stay here for free and eat your food. Well, I'll stay and eat your food, but I won't be happy about it. I think you all have a lot to think about. I'll be in my room. That night, Melissa uses her witch powers to go into Jody's dreams and shows him that a long time ago, a group of townspeople with torches came to her family home and accused her father of harboring a witch. And I have to say, this is actually pretty funny because the whole mob is chanting, burn the witch, but then when they actually get to the house, everybody just goes kind of silent and Melissa's dad comes outside like, Yes. Burn the witch! Burn the witch! I just love how there's this awkward moment of silence as if the mob didn't decide beforehand who was gonna talk. So they all get there just like... What? What thought you were just... So the one guy is like, hey, so there's been some bad things happening around the town lately and nothing bad has happened to you. So one of your daughters has got to be a witch. The plague is hit near everybody here, David Strickland. But it ain't hit you now. How do you explain that? Yeah, and I heard he's got a bunch of cheese in there too. Exotic cheeses. Cheeses that I've never even heard of before. And all I've got at my house is just a small brick of cheddar. So where'd you get all that cheese, Mr. Strickland? Hmm? Sure sounds like witchcraft to me, which I'm sure we'd all be willing to overlook if you just shared some of that cheese with us. Right? I mean, yeah, okay, a witch is bad. I'm not gonna argue with that. But if that witch is in there, conjuring up a bunch of delicious cheese in a cauldron that we could all be eating. I mean, come on, I'd say that's worth a little bit of plague, right? A little plague never hurt anybody. Anyways, they take Lucinda and start to burn her at the stake, but the devil tells Melissa that if she wants to save her sister, all she has to do is raise her right hand and put out the fire. And in return, Melissa just has to 
wait for the devil to come back one day. So basically, she's cursed with not being able to grow old, which you might think is not that bad of a deal, but I would actually hate that. I mean, Melissa is technically 127 years old. That would suck. Imagine trying to relate to people 100 years younger than you. So Jody wakes up and gets out of bed. You'd think to leave and never come back, but no, he goes and tells Melissa that he doesn't believe any of it and that he loves her. All right, what the hell is going on? I've seen this before. This happened two videos ago. You know, the main character is cursed. They meet someone new. And then 24 hours later, that person is like, yeah, I love you. Folks, there are options out there. All right, there's more fish in the sea without curses. Maybe one of them has a substantial collection of Bazooka Joe comics, I don't know. So Melissa tells him that in order to save her, he has to believe that it's all true. And Jody, honestly, dude, even if it's not true, do you really want to be with someone who believes the devil is inside of them? That does not sound like fun. That sounds like a lot of headaches. Anyways, Lucinda comes in and starts attacking Jody, so Melissa sets her on fire, which is kind of ironic when you think about it. So Jody decides to leave. It's probably the first smart thing he's done in this entire movie. But wait, he just can't resist Melissa for some reason, so he turns around and has sex with her, which releases her from the curse. Wait, she didn't have sex for, what, like over a hundred years? That's... Damn, okay, and you know what? It actually kind of makes sense now that she was so desperate. But now she's aging rapidly. She's going to die. So in order to save her, Jody raises his right hand and makes a deal with the devil. Well, great going, Jody. You had your little road trip to think about your future and you ended up making a deal with the devil. Which would have happened anyways if you decided to become a lawyer, but that probably would have been preferable because <laughs> I mean, if you're gonna make a deal with the devil, you might as well at least get paid. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's some stupid stuff in this movie, like Jody being convinced he's in love with Melissa. I mean, you've spent less than 48 hours with her, and during that time, you've done what? Gone for a walk, fed some goats, went to the store, and that's got you so head over heels that you're willing to turn a blind eye to everything else? Such as the fact that everyone in town thinks she's a witch, she says she's a witch, her sister murders people, the family then covers up those murders and handcuffs you and locks you in a shed. I mean, if you were to weigh out the experiences at this ranch over the past two days, I think there were less good things than unbelievably awful things. So unless she put a spell on him, this makes absolutely no sense. Also, who are these people? They're obviously not her real parents. They're not her kids. So who the hell are they? I mean, they clearly know the deal with Melissa and Lucinda and they're down with it. I mean, they're again, they're covering up murders. This guy is throwing police cars off of cliffs. He's resorted to wily coyote type methods to get rid of evidence and apparently they've been doing this for a while to the point that at the beginning of the movie they're like oh lucinda not again but the movie never tells us the actual relationship between these people and the sisters so that's dumb this movie came out in 1971 the version that i got had the alternate title of night of the demon for some reason the cinematographer for this movie went on to be the cinematographer for blade runner which i thought was interesting and if you're a really big fan of horror films i would recommend checking this out because even though there's a lot of things wrong with it i found that the concept was actually pretty interesting but that's pretty much it for this one. As usual, thanks for watching, guys, and I'll see you all next time. Also, I wanted to bring this up while we're all together. Um, the pitchforks, I'm not really a fan. It just seems a tad aggressive. To me, it sends the message that we've already determined there's a witch in that house, and if we don't get her, someone's getting stabbed. And that's, you know, it's just, it's not very neighborly. If, if that makes sense. I mean, if we had 
the, the pitchforks in this position when we arrived. You know, to me, this just seems less judgy. Is, that, is any of this making sense? And, and it still provides an adequate form of defense in case there's a surprise witch attack, right? Uh, oh, there's a witch, bonk, just something to consider for the next witch hunt, which I'm sure is gonna be in a week. Also, it's hot tonight. Is anybody else hot? Do, do we need the torches? Um, I, mean, I, I understand why we have the torches. We wanted to make an entrance, and there's no doubt we did. I think we looked totally cool marching up to this house, but uh, moving forward, can't we just light the torches when we're actually about to burn the witch? Just some things to consider. I think you all have a lot to think about. I'll be in my room. Also, uh, we're out of toilet paper upstairs. And while we're on the subject, whoever is painting the bowl every night, figure it out. Get some Tums, get some Pepto. It's just, like, disgusting. When I was writing it, I was like, hmm. Now, there's a lot of walnut jokes in here, Mark. Might be too much. You know, there's like the rule of three, right? You know, you do it three times and then that's it. But, uh, I don't know, I'm feeling a little dangerous today, so. There's the question for the comment section. How many walnut jokes do I have to make until you click off the video, hit unsubscribe, and um, never want to hear from me again? <laughs>